Steve, the fine-tuning of the universe of the constants of physics is a somewhat controversial subject. I'd like to ask you about the so-called cosmological constant and the apparent incredible fine-tuning that that has to be. Uh, well, the, uh, the question is, what is the energy in empty space? Uh, you know, most people would say, uh, that's a dumb question. Empty space is empty. <laughs> There's nothing there. Uh, but, you know, uh, from the point of view of, of quantum mechanics, in particular what's called the uncertainty principle, you can't really say there's nothing there. Um, in quantum mechanics, uh, you c if you know precisely what the position of something is, you can't know how fast it's moving and vice versa. And likewise, if you know precisely the value of a field, like the electric field or the magnetic field or the gravitational field, you can't know precisely how fast it's changing. So the statement that there are no fields in empty space, that the electric field and the magnetic field and the gravitational field are all absent, is just not one that can be made. You're not allowed to say that. Mm. Instead, uh, empty space is uh, roiling with fluctuating fields, uh, whose uh, average energy is something. We don't have to be able to calculate what it is. Uh, it's the same everywhere because space is featureless, but it's just a constant, uh, a certain energy per volume, per cubic foot or whatever, of empty space. Uh, what is that number? Uh, well, you could try to estimate what it is uh, on the basis of fundamental theory. Uh, now, we can calculate it to some extent. That is, we know a lot about electric and magnetic and gravitational fields, and we can calculate uh, what the energy is in fields of various wavelengths. Uh, if you go for wavelengths, which are the kind of lengths that we study in elementary particle laboratories or in everyday life or in cosmology, we know how to do that calculation. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you go to very, very short wavelengths, wavelengths shorter than, let's say, the hundredth the size of an atomic nucleus, we have to give up. We say our theories are not good enough to tell us. We don't know what other fields there might be present, and, and we just have to accept it. So you can say not what is the energy in empty space, but what is the energy uh, in the fluctuations of fields of wavelengths larger than the smallest wavelength that we can study in the laboratory, that energy turns out to be huge. When I say huge, I mean it's enough so that if the energy of empty space was that large, the universe could never have evolved the way it has. If it was positive, the universe would have blown up uh, exponentially fast, much too fast to ever allow stars or galaxies. If it was negative, the universe would have immediately collapsed big crunch immediately, a tiny fraction of a second after the beginning. So just from the fact that the universe has been expanding for billions of years, we can put a, an upper bound on the energy of empty space, a, a cosmological upper bound. It can't be bigger than that. And that upper bound is 56 orders of magnitude smaller than the value we would estimate, taking into account all the wavelengths we understand. In other words, if we consider all the fluctuations of fields at wavelengths where we understand the physics, the energy in empty space is 56 orders of magnitude too large to be allowed by the way the universe is expanding. That sounds like the worst mismatch between theory yeah. and observation that I've ever yeah, heard. You can, I mean, this is, you know, you don't, well, one good thing about it is you don't have to worry about having made a mistake of a factor of two somewhere in the <laughs> right, calculation right. because the answer is so bad that no possible error Right. Uh, of, you know, a factor of two or a factor of pi could possibly right. explain it. Right. Um, and uh, so some, something has, something's wrong somewhere. Well, uh, one answer is, uh, I mean, there's several answers to that. One answer is, who cares? Uh, you might say, well, nobody really cares what the energy is of empty space because we only measure differences in energy in everyday life. I mean, when you calculate what is the energy of a ball on top of a hill as measured by how much fast the ball is rolling when it gets to the bottom of the hill? What you're really talking about is the difference in energy on top of the hill and the bottom of the hill. And as long as 
it's just a constant. Who cares? Well, it, it matters because it affects the expansion of the universe, as I already said. So for that reason, we do have to care about it. Another answer is, well, we only considered wavelengths down to a certain minimum size. Maybe at smaller wavelengths, something cancels it. But that cancellation has to be good to 56 mm -hmm. decimal places. Well, you know, that, well, maybe so, but it cries out for an explanation. And uh, nobody has an explanation. That This is the bone in the throat of theoretical physics right now. Uh, why is that constant what it is? Now, for a long time, theorists took the attitude that since the theoretical estimates turn out to be 56 orders of magnitude, when I say 56 orders of magnitude, I mean a one with 56 zeros after it, that number too big, maybe the for some profound reason, the answer is zero. We just haven't thought of that reason yet. And the answer is there is no energy in empty space for some fundamental reason, which just hasn't yet been explained to us. Because that constant is so close to zero. Yeah, it's but so not close. not zero. It's, well, wait. It, <laughs> we knew for a long time that it was very close to zero. And it was perfectly possible that it was zero for a long time. And since it was so much smaller than what you would theoretically expect, the natural reaction was, well, there must be some reason why it's in fact zero. Uh, you know, if you if you think that uh, if you think that the streets of New York are paved with gold, and then when you arrive in New York, you look around. There's no gold here. There's no gold there. Eventually, you come <laughs> to the conclusion there's no gold on the streets of New York. Right, right, right. Uh, none at all. Well, but then uh, it turned out through the work brilliant observational work of astronomers uh, using the Hubble Space Telescope and also ground-based telescopes, uh, studying the way the expansion of the universe is going, that in fact uh, the expansion of the universe can best be understood as telling us that there is a certain energy in empty space. It is indeed some 56 orders of magnitude smaller than you would expect, but it's not zero, it's positive, it's not negative. And we know what it is. And in fact, it makes up approximately 70% of the total energy budget of the universe. 70% so the, so of the energy content of the universe is in empty space, so-called dark energy. It's often called that. Um, and uh, it has a characteristic effect of causing the expansion of the universe to accelerate rather than slow down. So this bone in the throat of theoretical physicists in terms of the cosmological constant has just gotten bigger. It's gotten to be two bones. <laughs> One is, why is it not enormously larger than it is? And the other is, why is it what it is? In particular, I, I said it was 70% of the total energy budget. Well, 70% is means that 30% is something else. And the two numbers are not that different. 70% uh, and 30%, it's a factor of 2.3. Um, those numbers are fairly comparable, considering how small they both are compared to sure. what you might expect. And uh, that's the second bone in the throat. And it's particularly disturbing, because it's not just a question, why are those two numbers the same? Those no the energy in, in ordinary matter whether it's uh, so-called dark matter, which we don't yet know what it is, or ordinary electrons and protons, that energy per volume is changing as the universe expands. Naturally, as the universe expands, the particles get further and further apart. The energy per volume in, in ordinary matter decreases, decreases with time. The energy in empty space per volume is always the same. You get more volume, you get more energy. But per volume, it's always the same. So those numbers, if they're nearly equal or only different by a factor of two and a half now, were vastly different in the past. In fact, in the past, the energy in empty space was negligible compared to the energy in matter. And in the future, the energy in empty space will be completely dominant. And the universe will expand exponentially and matter will play very little role. We are living at an epoch when the two are somewhat balanced, although the energy in empty space is larger. That's really the second thing. Why? It's the why now question. Why are we living at a time when the energies 
are not that different, or why do they not are not why are they not that different at the time we happen to be living in? So people have talked about a way to explain this, and there's a principle that floats around called the anthropic principle. Yeah. What's your understanding of that? Well, the anthropic principle stated boldly is that things are the way they are because otherwise we wouldn't be here, and that which sounds sort of nonsensical and uh, trivial. Yeah, well, <laughs> either trivial or nonsensical. If you say trivial in the sense that uh, you just take the fact that we're here as an experimental fact, that's trivial. If you say that we take the fact that we're here as an explanation of why things are the way they are, not just as a casual observation, then it sounds nonsensical <laughs> or it sounds religious or something. Or circular. Uh, well, I don't know. But uh, it may, the anthropic principle to me makes sense only if there are a vast number of, quote, universes of big bangs uh, or some not so big, some where the universe goes through its life cycle very briefly, uh, in some sense, perhaps located at different points in space or different eras in time or different parts of the quantum mechanical wave function of the universe. But in some sense, the universe, what we usually call the universe is just one episode, one part of a much larger multiverse in which various constants, including the energy in empty space, vary from, quote, universe to universe. In that case, we can. it is natural that we will be only in the kind of universe which could support life. Now, if the cosmological constant were much bigger than it is, then the universe would have gone through its expansion so rapidly galaxies and stars would not have formed. And in fact, you could calculate what, you, what would be the typical universe in which... Uh, the cosmological constant is small enough so that astronomers would exist, weighted by the number of astronomers. <laughs> and it turns out that our universe, the vacuum energy is a little low. You might expect it to be, oh, 10 times larger or five times larger, but it's not a very unusual kind of universe from this kind of uh, anthropic calculation. Now, does this make sense? I don't know. It makes sense only... It does make sense if there really are a variety of universes in which the cosmological constant varies from universe to universe. And that is the case in modern string theories. In fact, the number of these, quote, universes, each corresponding to a different solution of the equations of string theory, which are incidentally not really well understood, uh, is vast. It's like 10 to the 500, a one with 500 zeros. So um, string theory provides a concrete realization of this possibility. As earlier, certain theories of the origin of the universe, so-called chaotic inflation, had done, where the different universes are different parts of space-time. The picture is that the universe expands not like a... Uh, uniformly expanding cloud of gas, but like uh, water in a tea kettle where bubbles of steam are continually <laughs> bubbling. And we're just one bubble that happens to be bubbling. And there are many others in different parts of the tea kettle. The tea kettle may be infinite, in fact. There may be an infinite number of these expanding bubbles. In all of these different versions of the multiverse idea, the anthropic principle is just common sense. And to underline that this is not, you know, this isn't really so flaky, uh, I'd make an analogy with the situation with planets. Uh, why are conditions on the Earth the way they are? Why is the Earth such a comfortable place? Well, if the Earth was any closer to the sun or further from the sun, water wouldn't be liquid on the surface. There's just a narrow range in which the Earth is habitable. Uh, the philosopher, well, actually the physician, Galen, had actually, uh, in Roman times, argued that the, he didn't ask why the Earth is where it is because he thought the Earth was the center of the universe. He thought the sun was a planet. He said, <laughs> why is the sun where it is? And he said, it has to be there because otherwise life would be impossible on Earth. 
the same sort of thing. Now, does that make sense? Well, if the Earth was the only planet in the universe, then I would say that either that reasoning doesn't make sense, or as Galen would argue, it shows the evidence of a benevolent creator, because someone had to fine tune things to make us possible. On the other hand, if there are billions of planets, and we now know that there are, in our solar system there are at least nine, the vast majority of them are planets that are inhospitable to life as we know it, even in our solar system, we're the only one out of nine where water is liquid on the surface, then uh, the fact that the Earth is where it is, is is no longer so mysterious because it's only on planets where conditions are right, like as they are on Earth, where there are, could possibly be anyone to ask the question. Galen couldn't exist on Neptune or Mercury. It would be too cold or too hot. But the analogy to universes then presupposes multiple universes, just like you had multiple planets yeah. in your analogy. You yes, have to exactly. Have it, or it doesn't now, work. Now, no one, no one argued for multiple planets on the basis of explaining why the Earth, where the Earth is. This kind of anthropic reasoning <laughs> was not the basis right. of right. the theory that there are multiple planets. Right. That <laughs> understanding came because we observe multiple planets first right. in the solar system and then around other stars. So it's not that the, anth the anthropic explanation drove the understanding of multiple planets. And in the same way, I would say no, it would be very foolish to argue just on anthropic grounds that there must be a multiverse. But we may come to the conclusion on other grounds that there is a multiverse. And string theory seems to point in that direction, as indeed theories of chaotic inflation had already done. So that given on other grounds that there is a multiplicity of universes, anthropic reasoning then just becomes common sense. Why do some theoretical physicists react rather violently against anthropic reasoning? Well, to some, it may seem like a misunderstanding. To some, there may be just some misunderstanding that uh, they, some people may think that uh, we're taking the anthropic argument as a fundamental hypothesis, you know, that uh, we think that the laws of nature have to be fine-tuned to make us possible uh, as some kind of uh, principle of universal benevolence. Um, and I don't look at it that way at all. Uh, others regard it, and I think this has a good deal more justice to it, as a retreat, and it is a retreat. Uh, I would love to throw the anthropic principle out the window and tomorrow sit down and calculate the value of the vacuum energy from first principles and publish that in physical review letters. <laughs> and um, I can't imagine much else that would make me as happy. Uh, and not being able to do that represents a retreat. But we have to accept that, just as uh, we had to accept that we will never calculate the distance of the Earth from the sun from first principles, that we have to regard that as just an environmental accident uh, with a uh, bias factor due to the fact that living things are on Earth to ask the question. Uh, in the same way, we may have to accept that we will never be able to calculate the energy in empty space and indeed many other things from first principles. And that would be a pity. And I would love it if that were not true. I would, I would be the first one to celebrate the demise of the anthropic principle if that came about through the discovery of a theory that allowed us to calculate all these other things. And I don't think we should give up looking for such a theory. I don't think the idea of the anthropic principle should make us uh, content uh, or should stop research in, in other directions. But it is a possibility we may have to face. It's not logically absurd. It's Given the context of a multiverse, it is just common sense. We don't know there is a multiverse, but there are suggestions of it from other other ideas. And if it is, if it turns out to be right, then we will have to live in this kind of world in which we have a diminished capacity to calculate things. <laughs>